Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, this morning, uh, I thought I'd uh, thank you, by the way, Stuart, for the graphic on summer school. We are entering into summer school here, and we're going to be taking on something a bit ambitious. Um, we're going to be actually starting a series that's going to take us to the end of November. Yay, everybody said. Yay, Yay! woo! But we're, we're going to be working through... Uh, a very important thing. We're going to actually sit down at Jesus' feet and we're going to let him school us. That's kind of the goal over the next few months. Um, we're going to learn why he came, uh, what he wants us to know, and how we're to live. And we're going to hear these straight from Jesus himself as we place ourselves uh, under his feet as we position ourselves much like the first hearers at the Sermon on the Mount. And he turned the world upside down, completely. He offered an alternative to how people, whether they were religious or not, he offered an alternative to how they're to live and give their lives purpose and meaning. And Jesus came to rescue us, to save us, also to apprentice us, to be his followers, because he knew we have no clue, <laughs> to be honest. We are thrown around, and we will follow anything or anyone. We are just by our nature sheep, and we will follow through. Many times we think we're setting our own path on our own course, but truth be known, we're probably following somebody else's dream or, or uh, uh, something fleeting that doesn't really pay off in the long run. And what a waste of this precious life to be chasing things that don't matter. The struggles we face are often because we're looking for meaning and answers in worthless things. Uh, we seek to gain the whole world, and yet we forfeit our soul. We are consumed with acquiring that one pleasure that we know in our minds and our hearts that will finally satisfy us. And we won't listen to those that have acquired that pleasure and say, no, it doesn't satisfy. Well, I'm different. It will be different for me. And it's not. We spend our lives trying to prove that we're lovable and we're worthy. And we get exhausted. We try and do things that we think God wants of us and the things that he never asked of us. So many times we think, oh, this is what the boss would want. I'm going to go and do this. And he looks upon us and goes, why are you wasting your time on that? I never asked you to do that in the first place. We're going to be learning what is important and what is not. And Jesus speaks to this, and he leads us in practical ways. And we see it powerfully in the Sermon on the Mount. And um, we're going to see that God is doing something in our midst here, at this church right now. And I stand on shaky ground when I say this, because it is amazing to see what God has done. In the past year, this is God has done this, trust me. He's done it despite me, and he's done it uh, amongst us. Last year, we had 14 people that followed the Lord through baptism. Praise God. This year so far, we've had 15 people that have followed the Lord through baptism. I have a list right now. That baptism was two weeks ago. I have a list right now of nine people that have experienced interest in wanting to be baptized. Wonderful. Praise God. That's really, really good. And I'm going to do something else a little bit more practical. I did this last summer, and I thought I'd do it this year as well. So if you started attending or came back to start attending Ormocto Baptist Church since 2022, okay, January of 2022, if you started to come here since then, can you please stand up? Since 2022. Okay. Everyone look around. Thank you. You may be seated. That's half our church. Literally, that's half our church has been coming in the past two years. Those are all good things. Those are great things. But believe it or not, it makes me nervous. <laughs> it really does. Because attending, that's, that's the part of where you come and hear about Jesus. And that's awesome. 
God can't transform you unless he has your ear. So I'm grateful, so grateful that people are coming and attending and hearing God's word. And baptism is extraordinary. It's a first step and it's a first step and, and, and a leap of faith that people take and a significant part of our Christian walk and, and I believe it's extremely important not just because we have the word Baptist on our front door I believe it's important because we see it in scripture as one of the things that Jesus asks of his disciples to repent to believe and to be baptized I think that's I think it's significant I think it's important but I also read through the scriptures and I see that when we see the account of Jesus baptism starts his ministry. Do you know what happens immediately after he's baptized? He's tempted. And he's taken into the wilderness. And the tempting starts. And the testing comes. And it's not easy. And when I look out and I see the growth and I see the people coming and it's wonderful, the one thing that goes through my heart is I want y'all equipped because the testing and the trials are coming. And maybe you've already faced them. And I don't want you to just to spring up, but I want you to be strong to hold through it. And life will test you. And in that, you're going to need strong roots. So this morning, even though I'm starting a series on the Sermon on the Mount, I'm actually starting with another passage of Scripture. The parable of the soils. So if you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to open it up. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 13. For those of you at home, please take, uh, take a moment and grab a Bible. Any way you can get a Bible, get it. If you, if you have a physical one, always good. If you're somebody that's used to using your device, use that. But there's always opportunity. We have, a, <laughs> we have no excuse to not have God's Word in our hands nowadays. People in places around the world over time would, would cry out to know how available we have God's Word in our hands. So we're going to look to the parable of the soils, and it's from Matthew chapter 13, and I'll be reading a couple of sections, verses 3 through 9, and again verses 18 through 23. And here's what God's Word says. Then he, being Jesus, spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured it. And some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched and became like they had no root, and because it was they had no root, and they withered away. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. And picking up in verse 18, Jesus explains this parable. And he says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that which was sown in his heart. This is who received the seed by the wayside. But he who receives the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And now he who receives the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Every gardener looks for signs of life in their gardens. And when that first little sprig of green comes up, not just does it spring from the soil, but a smile springs on their faces. Finally, it took. And uh, as we uh, look, we see that each potential plant that comes up and that first sprig of life that comes forth from the ground, we get excited. 
We, we, we get excited because of the potential. And we have dreams of how big our tomato plants are going to be. <laughs> or this year we're going to have the giant uh, pumpkin that's going to win uh, nationally or, or internationally. All these dreams of the potential. But every gardener knows every plant is not a guarantee. Every plant is a potential, but not a guarantee. What the gardeners want to see most of all is uh, a crop. They want to see a harvest. They definitely don't want to be disappointed. They want to see this come to fruition. And as I've shared, new life is amazing, and I'm so excited to see the new life in our church. I am so excited to see the new life in our church. But enduring and thriving is the goal. Amen? That's what we need to hold on to. Not just that we start well, but that we end well. So that when we come to the point of our life when we're facing crisis, we have a faith that we can hold on to and say, it is well with my soul. And that's why we're going to be working through this, this series together. So what, what's, this, um, what's this parable about? Well, it's, it's fairly straightforward. This is a preacher's dream, by the way. Jesus gives us a parable and he explains it. <laughs> Feels like you're cheating when you're going through this. It's like, I can preach this. Well, because you're just repeating what Jesus said. But what is this whole parable about? Well, it's about um, some core things. It's a common agricultural analogy. This is a very common understanding in these days. Back then, um, groceries uh, weren't a thing. Back then, there was fruits and vegetables and meat and dairy that, that you farmed yourself or you knew where it came from. You don't have little children that thinks that uh, vegetables grow in grocery stores. This was a time where people knew where their food came from. And most grew their own or knew somebody that did grow theirs. And this is seeing a, a parable that Jesus is laying out of a deliberate act of a person to bring in a crop. There's four key things in this. We see there's a sower, there's seed or seeds, there's soils, and then there's a harvest. Those are the four key components that we see in this. The sower, most of the time we believe the sower is God himself. We, we can draw some analogies from the next parable that Jesus talks about, where he talks about the wheat and the tares, and he talks about the farmer being the one that's the owner of the field, putting his seed in the, in the field. But, but it's fairly understood that this is God himself that is sowing the seed. It may be a representative of his. People could argue that perhaps a preacher for God is sowing the seed as well. But most of the time we see this as God doing his work because it's implied that it's his field that he's placing these seeds in. And the second thing we see, uh, and verse 19 helps us out about the seed. The seed is the message about the kingdom. In verse 19, it says the seed is the message about the kingdom. So when you read through it, it's not just necessarily the Bible. It's Jesus' specific teaching on the kingdom of God. And we see that in verse 19. That's the seed that's being planted. The soils we pick up on as being uh, the hearts of those that hear the message. Verse 19 tells us this. Uh, it was sown in their hearts, or it was not able to break through in their hearts. So there's a very clear uh, drawing between the soils and hearts. And the, the heart is not an organ that can need repair. But the heart, in the, in the mind of the Hebrew listener, the, the heart is that place that's the center of physical, emotional, and intellectual, and even moral activity. It's kind of the who you are. It's kind of like when you say you're to love someone from your heart, you know what we're talking about. It's the place of decisions. It's the place where um, you process Many people would say it's the place where you define who you are. That's the heart. And this is where the seeds are seeking to be planted. And there's different types of soils, and we're going to look into that. And then finally, there's a harvest. And the harvest, uh, we see, that's the fruit that flows from a healthy plant that's far greater than the seed it came from. 
uh, or the purpose. Just, just a few days ago, uh, not that long ago, I had a chance to be at my mom and dad's. It's good to have them here today. And I, I looked at the back and, and I saw one of their apple trees and just how, how it's now gone out of blossom and starting to form the little apples that's in the process. And to think that that tree that has existed there for as long as I've been around that property and longer than that, over 30, 40 years, how many apples have come from one seed that produced that tree however many decades ago? That's what a harvest is. Not just the year that is coming up and the fruit from that year, but the seeds planted in it that will create future harvests. That's what farmers are uh, concerned with, and that's what the sower is interested in. A sower uses a seed and uses soil, but he's interested in the harvest. And so when we see this, there's only really one variable in the whole thing. The seeds are all the same. The sower is all the same. But the variable is the soils. And that's what we see Jesus laying out in this parable. And we see in the first one that these soils uh, are, are differentiated. The first one says, some seeds fell by the wayside. That's in Matthew 13 and verse 4. Some of the seeds that were cast were cast along the wayside. Maybe some say this is a well-trodden path, to use fancy trodden words. But anybody knows a footpath. And anybody that's traveled on a footpath knows that's not the ideal place for uh, vegetation to start to spring up. It's a well-traveled path, realizing that the parable refers to soils as hearts. It is not a stretch to say this is the hardened heart. This is a seed that's thrown upon the hardened heart for whatever reason, and no judgment placed on what made that heart hard. It just is. And the seed that's thrown on this hardened heart, for whatever reason, never breaks through. It never takes root. The message of the kingdom never gets beyond the ears. It's in one ear, out the other, even if it got that far. It might not even got that far. When you think about this, I think of this, the hand that says, nope. And even though you might not see a hand that does this, there's a heart that's doing this inside of a person when they just don't want to hear the message about the kingdom of God. Nope. Not at all receptive. And therefore, it's never understood because it's never processed. And before we stop and go, oh, I know people like that, you were people like that. And at times, you will be people like that again. We will encounter things that will make our hearts hard. And we will be resisting what God has to say to us. So let's not be pointing fingers. So what do we do if God is placing that seed on a hardened heart? Well, I like using scripture. And Ezekiel 36, 26 reminds us that God can replace a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And that's our prayer. God, soften my heart soften their heart, break through the hardness so that your word can break in. Until that happens, we are wasting our breath and our effort. That's what the parable tells us. The sower realizes that those seeds will be we swept away and stolen away. So that's the first one. That's the first type of soil. The second type of soil, we're told, is the seeds that fell upon the stony places, the seeds that fell upon the stony places. We see this in verses 5 to 6, and then he describes it in verses 20 and 21. Uh, and, and this is uh, the seed that fell on the stony places. Galilee, where the parable is being done and where Jesus is speaking, is blessed with a lot of rocks. <laughs> it has an abundance of rocks. Uh, we, we help out Pastor Devin preaches on, on Sunday afternoons down at Upper Gagetown, and we're told that that is a uh, rock pit dream. There's amazing gravel that exists down in, in Upper Gagetown. Well, Galilee would be second to it. There is a lot of rocks and gravel and stones in Galilee. And the soil that does exist there is typically a mile wide and an inch deep, if you've heard that expression. 
very shallow soil that falls on top of all this rocky ground. And in this type of a ground, a seed will enter into the soil, but it won't go deep because of the shallowness of the soil, because of the stones that are underneath of it. Shallowness is an epidemic in our world. Shallowness is, is uh, very, very common. It, it, it's a veneer. It's a veneer of openness. It's a, it's a veneer that says, okay, my heart isn't hard. I feel some, but only this much. And, and it's impossible for a seed to take deep root into that. It can take some root, but it, will, it won't take deep root. And sure, they might respond to the message and go, yes, it sounds good. But what happens is that they have joy without understanding, is what the scriptures say in verses 20 and 21. They've got joy. This is what Jesus offers? This is amazing. Yes, I want this. I want eternal life. I want to have all the blessings that he lays out. Of course I want this. But then the cares and the concerns, we're going to see later on, robs at it. But, but since it's shallow, it doesn't hold up to anything. It, it doesn't hold up to normal pressure in life. The first rainstorm washes away. The first heavy wind blows up its roots. There's a shallowness that doesn't allow this uh, seed to take root. There's no commitment, and it falls under normal pressure. Not extraordinary pressure, normal pressure, just daily life. You know, I, I've come to faith. I, be, I believe in Jesus. Okay, great. Will you be at church on Sunday? Uh, right? You know, like... Um, Hey, you want to hear this dirty joke that I've heard? I, I, let me share it with you. Well, I suppose. I don't want to offend them by not listening in and taking part and sharing in the banter again. And eventually, the, the new life fizzles up and dies. And unfortunately, I am most afraid of the shallow soil. Why I'm afraid of it is because you can get inoculated to Christianity. Do you know what I mean by inoculated? A little bit of a dead virus that's put in you so that you don't catch the real thing. And so there's folks that say, oh yeah, I, I accepted Jesus when I was at camp and I was 13 years old. Never really worked for me, so I'm, I've turned away from that completely altogether now. That's scary. I'd rather them not have heard the gospel rather than, oh, I've heard it and it didn't work for me. And they walk away. What happens when you have a little bit of faith, but you know it's not deep? Well, then I, I would encourage you to go to the scriptures again and, and pray as the man prayed whose, whose child needed healing. And in Mark 9, verses 23 and 24, Jesus says, um, do you believe to this man that he can heal? And the man says, yes, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So if you do have a faith and you recognize yourself it's a bit shallow, ask God to help your unbelief. Ask God to break through those stones underneath, the, underneath that uh, soil and make its soil go deeper so that his roots can break into deeper. Ask him to help you to believe more, to give you more root to dig down. Um, because the heart is still hard below the surface. And although it looks good, it's really short-lived. The next one we see is the parable of the soils, the ones that fell among the thorns. And uh, this is fertile soil. I mean, this is really good soil. This isn't shallow soil. This is deep soil. And some of the, the seeds that fell into this, um, they took root. But unfortunately, this fertile soil was so, so fertile, it was open to everything. And it accepted and received everything. That was poured into it. Oh, Jesus, oh yeah, I believe that. Uh, and uh, a Marxism, oh yeah, oh, I believe that. And uh, this belief system, oh yeah, I believe that. And all of it comes in and it all takes root. And it's all growing up amongst its, the other things. The thorns grow up amongst it. And the weeds grow up amongst it. And then the good fruit grows up amongst it. And there's this constant battle going on beneath the surface to find out where can my roots dig into this soil. 
How much of my heart is open to Jesus and the message of the kingdom? How much of my heart is open to this? How much is open to this? And when it's open to everything, everything gets choked off. See, the heart was already seeded. There was already, already things in there, and it just all came up together. The scripture tells us that there's two key areas where it took root. One was the, about the anxiety, and one was about um, that there's something better that's out there. I don't know many people that have hearts that don't struggle with anxiety. That's just a, a, a blanket statement. I don't know many people that have hearts that don't struggle with anxiety. There is the rare person that never worries, that is calm, caring in all situations, that is not stressed, that doesn't go through what ifs, but maybe, how come? That, that is a seed that's in many of our soil, and, and, and it can easily take root. But there's also another type of seed that exists in there. And it's the one that's, that's basically the lie from Satan that was planted in Eve's mind and in Adam's mind that God is holding something good back from us. There is a pleasure, there is a satisfaction that I can find that's different than what God offers that's, that's better. God isn't giving me the best. There's, there's something out, out there that's better. And when those three things are trying to take root in the soil of your heart, there's some, there's some pleasure that's better. Uh, God and his kingdom is good. And there's anxiousness and worry about the past. You can see how they'll choke each other, right? And unfortunately, when a plant is choked, although it may live, it won't be fruitful. So what do I do with that soil, God? Because I see that in my life. David, after he, um, after he fell hard, uh, fell really hard. We see in Psalm 51, he comes back to God and he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. If you're struggling with, here's a pleasure that I think God wants, that God's keeping from me that will really satisfy me. If you're struggling with an anxiety or a worry or a care that's just consuming your heart, come to God and be honest with it. You're not going to be the only one. There's going to be many people that are going to be doing that. Say, God, created me a clean heart. Basically, weed me, God. Pull out the weeds that are not to be taking root in my heart. And instead, let me focus on what you want me to focus on, please, and bring freedom. So that, that's the third soil. And then there's the fourth soil. I like this soil. The soil that falls on good ground, where the heart was eager to receive. This soil, the farmer smiles and goes, finally. Good, 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 good. This is amazing. Look at, the, look at this grow. Look at this flourish. Look at this take off. See, the heart was eager to receive. And to that soil, the word was the most precious thing. It pushed everything else aside. And this word was the word of the kingdom of God. And the natural, beautiful, miraculous thing that happens is that when God's word is planting in a heart that is open, it will naturally become fruitful. It doesn't have to work at it. It doesn't labor. It naturally becomes fruitful because God's word on its own, his message of the kingdom, taking root in an open heart, will create a massive change by its very nature. You don't even have to help it along. It will just flourish. It just happens. I, it's, I don't have the time, but I could share stories of people in the church that said, I listened to God, I did what he asked of me, and oh man, has my life changed. The miracles that have come, I could never have imagined. And some of you know who you are. It's amazing what happens when you let God's word take root in your heart. But here's something I just want to cover really, really, really quickly. Did you notice when I had you read the scripture that we skipped a bunch? It's not because I'm like, oh, don't read that part. Yeah, go back and read that part. Because what's in the middle is it says this. Is Jesus is teaching in parables, and he's talking about the seed, and he says this. 
it, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The seed that is planted is the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. When that takes root in your heart, when you gain understanding, that's the key thing that we see in this parable, when they gain understanding, when it takes root in your heart, these are the mysteries of the very kingdom of heaven. And so next week, when we start the Sermon on the Mount series, it's all about the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus lays out for us in his very first teaching, here is what you need to know about the kingdom. Your part in it, what it means, how we live, the, the fullness of it. We're going to be looking at that in, in, a, in a greater way starting next week. And we need to focus on receiving and understanding God's word. The words of Jesus spoken to us about the kingdom of heaven. Because unreceptiveness, the wayside soil, the shallowness, the stony soil, and the preoccupation with the world, the thorny soil, are the enemies of experiencing a meaningful life. However, being rooted in Jesus with the right heart, with the good seed, will lead to fullness, satisfaction, fruitfulness, flourishing, even joy. As we come to remember what Christ has done for us, I'm going to ask the deacons to make their way up. And as they're coming up, I just want to remind you that as we come to the Lord's table, where we recognize what Jesus did for us, we have a God that transforms lives. Amen? Amen. And he transforms hearts. And he transforms soils. So maybe today your heart is hard. Not too hard for the tiller of God. <laughs> maybe your heart is shallow. And it's just below the surface there's a hardness. God can break through that as well and break it down and bring you deep and deep and deep. And maybe your heart is polluted. You wouldn't be the only one to have a polluted heart. But in that pollution, God can bring cleansing and he can open you up to receive what he has from you. I encourage you to reflect upon that as we come to the Lord's table because you are all welcome to his table if you want to know him deeper and you are in relationship with him. Okay. So 